Have you ever heard of Hamlet's Mill? It's an essay investigating the origins of human knowledge and its transmission through myth. It was first published in 1969 by Giorgio de Senzalana, professor of history and science at MIT, and Hirth von Dieschen, Johann Wolfgang Goethe University Stat, is a non-fiction work of history and comparative mythology, particularly a subfield of archaeoastronomy. It is mostly about the claim of the megalithic era, discovery of axial precession, and the encoding of this knowledge in mythology. The book was severely criticized, of course, by academia upon its publication. But of course they're going to do that. It's against everything that they are saying is. Of course they're not going to have an open mind about it. The main argument of the book may be summarized as the claim of an early Neolithic discovery of the precession of the equinox usually attributed to Hipparchus, 2nd century BCE, associated very long-lived megalithic civilization of unsuspected sophistication. I think it's very interesting that the word megalithic, they show this structure, and we all know from our chat with Neil Thompson that these acted as lightning rods, which would back up the whole Saturn theory premise, because it would have been very electric. They have a megalith as a large stone, been used to construct a prehistoric structure or a monument, either alone or together with stones. There are over 35,000 in Europe alone, mostly in the Northern Hemisphere, where it was very unlike, which goes further to back up Saturn theory. And that's what this is about. Which we have been talking about. Everything is connected truly. And earlier when uh, Brian Forrester talks about in early lost civilization, I think it could be attributed to that. Knowledge of this civilization about precession, associated with astrological ages, would have been encoded in mythology, typically in the form of a story relating to a millstone and a young protagonist. Hamlet's Mill, of the book's title, a reference to the Kinning, Kinning Amlo Kavan, recorded in the old Icelandic Skaldskaparmo. The authors indeed claim that mythology is primarily to be interpreted in terms of archaeoastronomy. Mythological language has exclusive reference to celestial phenomena, and they mock alternative interpretation in terms of fertility and agriculture. The book's project is an examination of the relics, fragments, and illusions that have survived the steep attrition of the ages. In particular, the book reconstructs a myth of a heavenly mill which rotates around the celestial pole and grinds out the world's salt and soil and is associated with the maelstrom. The maelstrom is a whirlpool. A whirlpool is a body of rotating water produced by opposing currents or a current running into an obstacle. You think it's a coincidence they call the current in the water by that name? You think it has anything to do with real current? It does. Small whirlpools form when a bath or a sink is draining. More powerful ones in seas or oceans may be termed maelstroms associated with the maelstrom. The millstone falling off its frame represents passing of one's age, of one age's pole star, symbolized by a ruler or king of some sort, Saturn, and its respiration in the overthrow of the old king of authority and the empowering of the new one, the establishment of a new order of the age, Jupiter and Saturn story, a new star moving into the position of the pole star. The authors attempt to demonstrate the prevalence of influence of this hypothetical civilization's ideas by analyzing the world's mythologies with an eye especially to all mill myths using cosmographic oddments from many eras and climes. A collection of yarn from Saxo Grammaticus. Snorri Sturlson M. Lodi's mill as a kinning for the seal. Fadasi. Fadasi. Plato, Plutarch, the Calavella, Mahabharata, and Gilgamesh, not to forget Africa, the Americas, and Oceania. Santilla and Duchand state in their introduction to Hamlet's Mill they are well aware of modern interpretations of myth and folklore, but find them shallow and lacking insight. The experts now are benighted by current folk fantasy, which is the belief that they are beyond all of this critics without nonsense and extremely wise. Consequently, Santilla and Duchenne prefer to rely on the work of meticulous scholars such as 
Adler, Lipsius, Qualson, Ball, and to go further back, of Athanasius Kircher and Petavius. They give reasons throughout the book for preferring the work of older scholars and the early mythologists themselves as the proper way to interpret myth. But this viewpoint did not sit well with their modern critics schooled in the current anthropology which has built up its own idea of the primitive and what came after. Santilla had previously published The Origins of Scientific Thought, on which Hamlet's Mill is subsequently based. Compare various statements in Hamlet's Mill to this quotation from The Origin of Scientific Thought. We can see, then, how, many, how so many myths, fantastic and arbitrary in semblance, of which the Greek tale of the Argonaut is a late offspring may provide a terminology of image motifs, a kind of code which is beginning to be broken. It was meant to allow those who knew a. to determine unequivocally the position of given planets in respect to the earth, to the firmament, and to one another, and b. to present what knowledge there was of the fabric of the world in the form of tales about how the world began. And of course, it was severely criticized by academia. That really is a no-brainer. And um, reception was mixed, but this is exactly what they were talking about, that our salt and oceans and soil came down to earth in form of strata, just like it looks when it's dug down into from the brown dwarf star Saturn, who was then replaced by Jupiter. It's really amazing that mainstream is so far off base. See, they don't even listen to the ancients and what they were saying. Crazy. In contrast, the classical scholar Harold Reich positively reviewed Hamlet's Mill. Reich was a colleague of Santella at MIT, and himself developed the archaeoastronomical interpretation of ancient myth in a series of lectures and publications similar to Hamlet's Mill, dealing more specifically with Greek mythology, Plestian, including an interpretation of the layout of Atlantis as a sort of map of the sky. Swedish astronomer Peter Nielsen, while recognizing that Hamlet's Mill does not qualify as a work of science, expressed admiration for it, as well as it being a source of inspiration when he wrote his own book on classic mythologies based on the night sky. Himmelwalvitz Salsauter, 1977. Himmelwalvitz Salsmeter, 1977. Itself a study aiming to uncover seismic, geological, astrological, and other natural events from mythology. Appreciates the book for its pioneer work in mythography. Judging that although controversial, Santilla and Von Dieschend have usefully flagged and collected Herculean amounts of relevant data. Nevertheless, the conclusion the authors draw from their data have been virtually ignored by the scientific and scholarly establishments. The 2 plus 2 equals 7 to them. So, what are you going to do? So, publishing history. Yeah, so this book uh, came out a little bit before Mr. Talbot's book. It's just another little flag, you know, a little dot to connect. Uh, an independent source come up with the same. The equinoctial point had nudged and nuzzled its way forward in the very same way as a car with automatic gear shift will nuzzle its way forward, unless we put it in neutral. And there was no way of putting the equinox in neutral. The infernal pushing and squeezing of the children of heaven had separated the parents, and now the time machine had been set rolling forever, bringing forth at every new age a new heaven and a new earth, in the words of scripture. As Hesiod says, the world had entered now the second stage, that of the giants, who were to wage a decisive battle with the restraining forces before their downfall. The vision of a whole world age with its downfall is given by the Ada, it comes in the very first poem, the Song of the Sibyl, the Voluspa, in which the prophetess Vala embraces past and future in adequately strange and obscure language. At the beginning of the age of the Aesir, the gods gather in council and give names to sun and moon, days and nights and seasons. They order the years and assign to the stars their places. On Idavalar, the world field, they establish their seat in the Golden Age and play checkers with golden pieces. 
and all is happiness until the three awful maidens come. This is another mystery. But once before, it is hinted, there has been a world war between Aesir and Vanir, which was terminated by a sharing of power. In a vision in which past and future blend in a flash, Vala sees the outcome and announces it to the high and low children of Heimdall, that is, to all men. She asks them to open their eyes to understand what the gods had to know, the breaking of the peace, the murder of Thiasi, Odin himself abetting the crime and nailing Thiasi's eyes to heaven. With this, a curtain is lifted briefly over a phase of the past, for Thiasi belongs to the powers that preceded the Aesir. In Greek terms, the Titans came before the gods. The main Vana, or Titanic powers, in Rydberg's thoughtful reconstruction, are the three brothers, Thiasi Voland, Urvandil Aigil, and Slagfin, the maker, the archer, and the musician. This finally locates Urvandil the archer, the father of Amlithus. He is one of the three sons of Ivalda, just as their counterparts in the Finnish epic are the sons of Kaleva. Now, the powers of the abyss are beginning to rise. The world is coming apart. At this point, Heimdall comes to the fore. He is the warner of Asgard, the guardian of the bridge between heaven and earth, the whitest of the Aesir. But his role, his freedom of action, is severely limited. He has many gifts. He can hear grass grow. He can see a hundred miles away. But these powers seem to remain ineffectual. He owns the Gjallarhorn, the great battle horn of the gods. He is the only one able to sound it, but he'll blow it only once when he summons the gods and heroes to Asgard to their last fight. Nordic speculation down to Richard Wagner has dwelt with gloomy satisfaction on Ragnarok, the twilight of the gods which will destroy the world. There is the prediction in the Song of the Sibyl and also in Snorri's Gilfaginning when the great dog Garm barks in front of the Gniba cave when the Fenrir wolf breaks his fetters and comes from the mouth of the river. His jaws snatching from heaven to earth and is joined by the Midgard serpent, the Heimdall, will blow the Gjallarhorn, the sound of which reaches through all the worlds. The battle is on, but it is written that the forces of order will go down fighting to atone for the initial wrong done by the gods. The world will be lost, good and bad together. Nagalfar, the ship of the dead, built with the nail pairings of the living, will sail through the dark waters and bring the enemy to the fray. Then, adds Snorri, the heavens are suddenly rent in twain, and out ride in shining squadrons Muspel's sons, and Surt with his flaming sword at the head of the Filkings. All engulfing flames come out with Surt the Black, who kills Freyr, the lord of the mill. Snorri makes Surt lord of Gimli, and likewise the king of eternal bliss at the southern end of the sky. He must be some timeless force which brings destructive fire to the world, but of this later. Hitherto, all has been luridly and catastrophically and murkily confused as it should be, but the character of Heimdall raises a number of sharp questions. He has appeared upon the scene as the son of nine mothers. To be the son of several mothers is a rare distinction even in mythology, and one which Heimdall shares only with Agni in the Rig Veda. And with Agni's son, Skanda, in the Mahabharata, Skanda, literally the jumping one or the hopping one, is the planet Mars, also called Kartikeya, inasmuch as he was born by the Kritika, the Pleiades. The Mahabharata insists on six as the number of the Pleiades as well as of the mothers of Skanda and gives a very broad and wild description of the birth and the installation of Kartikeya by the assembled gods as their generalissimo, which is shattering somehow, driving home how little one understands as yet. The nine mothers of Heimdall bring to mind, inevitably, the nine goddesses who turn the mill. The suspicion is not unfounded. Two of these mothers, Gjalp and Greip, seem to appear with changed names or generations as Fenya and Menya. The turning up of a plurality of mothers in the ancient north and in India might induce the experts eventually to reopen the trial of those perfectly nonsensical seven or nine, even fourteen, mother wombs which haunt 
the Babylonian account of the creation of man. Rydberg claims Heimdall to be the son of Mundulfiori. The story is then astronomical. Where does it lead? Thanks to the clues provided by Jacob Grimm, Rydberg and O.S. Reuter, and thanks to many hints written in the Rig Veda, Atarva, Veda, and at other unexpected places, one can offer a probable conclusion. Heimdall stands for the world axis, the Skamba. His head is the measurer, Mjotudr, of the same measures that the Sibyl claims to understand. Nine worlds I know, nine spaces of the measure tree which is beyond fear, the earth. Measure tree is the translation of the Mjotvidr, 